Hi, everyone. And so who are we? Well, my partners shot the side and said, yeah, here's but They are. And there is a Segura the other. The touch. There. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we got a Segura the other. Touch leader of DevOps. And then we have the Gita Pump Testa, main senior DevOps at OpenPass. I mean, another DevOps. So kind of mentioned OpenPass like two times already. So what's OpenPass? OpenPass is a technology company that provides infrastructure, platform, and financial services to different kinds across multiple economic sectors like agro, health, telecommunications, and many more. And all those clients have something in common. We have to ensure all of them high availability, high security, a high integrity. Why? Because we manage money. Imagine yourself, you use that application that we offer and you go to the to store and buy something and the application doesn't work. That can happen. We have to ensure a high ability system that works 24 hours a day. So we got a problem here because we got that application on premise. It's not that being on premise is wrong as long as you solve your solutions, right? But all those of these clients are expecting millions of users and high quality of users per minute. And this is no fun to see. This is happening right now. And it's happening with one of our biggest clients, personal pay. And just to give you some examples of, of the numbers that manages today with that application, you can see right now that they have 1.7 million users. They have 25,000 users currently. We got 27 million requests. We got 30 million transactions per day and over 160 million logs generated per day again. So to make it a little bit more interesting, this is coding in small talk and it's running on a bass machine. So what is the problem here? Like I said again, it's not that being on premise is wrong. It's wrong that it's on premise and we have these numbers. So there are a few problems here. First of all, we got a problem about scalability. Scaling on premise is no such as a thing. We need to go to a new store, buy new hardware, install it, then make all the configurations, put up applications. How are you finish all doing all that? The person drafted that came in, he get out. So it's not a good thing, right? Then we have problem deployment. Why? Because it's time to deploy a new version, even from your main application, your boss application, or a side application, soup process, you never know if something can go wrong. Maybe start consuming more CPU than normal, more memory than normal. And that not only affects that application, it affects all that is living in that same server. So we don't have a complete dependence between components. We are not able to reduce risk because like I said, anything could go wrong and take the whole server down. Let's say, for example, we have a subprocess that for, for a specific reason, when it gets a specific input, it just takes the whole server down. And we don't want that. Then we have a problem about observability. Yeah, some people could say, hey, we only have to look at one single point. Yeah, but remember, we have over 160 million logs. It's no such a thing to go through all that. And even, not only from the main application, you can, like you, like I said, we have soup processes. So to figure out what take the server out, it could take days, weeks, months. So we need to improve that. As you can see right now, it's not about problem about code because our code works fine. It's able to solve this necessities of our, of our clients. It's a problem about infrastructure. Where is it? So from our DevOps side, we need to figure out a way to go from on-premise to scalable containers in the cloud. And you're probably asking yourself right now, how, how we do that? And the first thing we had to figure out is how to make that on-premise, that multiple application run on a container. We, first, we got to grab that on-premise, copy and paste it into a container. It's not completely possible to copy and paste. We have to make a little changes, but try to co copy most of you can. That means having, as a first approach, static configurations, hard-coded data, and the same operating system. 
there are many options in the market to, to start off. But the most common one and the one we choose is to use Docker to build the image and to run the container. But containers are meant to run on any environment, from that to production. And for that, we need variability. So the second step is to figure out what changes between environments. There are many things that changes, but let's take some examples like endpoints, ports, log types, VM memory options, DB, a what from the DB? We got the cost, the username, the password, and many, many more things. Containers offers a lot of options to adapt to any environment, but the most common one, the simple one, and it get, gives a lot of opportunity is to use environment variables. You are able to inject this environment, this environment variables into that operating system. And if your code, or maybe from a, from a boot app script, you are able to grab those environment variables and insert them in the configuration that you need, then you can adapt to an environment. Just simple stuff. Cool. Now we have containers. We they run on any environment. And but what is the idea of containers is to be secure and lightweighted. And for that we had to keep at least a few points in mind. First of all, we have to use a basic operating system. Nothing fancy. We don't need Windows 11 running on that container. No, just what you need. Keep that in mind, just what you need. And with that idea of just what you need, we have to remove unnecessary packages or try to avoid installing them because more packages means more security patches and more weight. More weight means it takes longer to pull that image from the registry where it's stored and to boot out that container. I want the containers to start fast. That's what we want. What else we have to keep in mind? Based on these two types I give you, we also have to be able to boot up that application, boot up that container, do whatever we need with the basic resources and functionalities of the operating system. That means that choosing the correct operating system is very important. It's very important. And also talking about security, we have to remove super user roles. Because if a hacker gains access to that container, not only he can do whatever he wants in that container, he can even spread to the rest of the containers next to it. And we don't want that. Cool. Now we got containers. But the problems doesn't end there. We still got problems. What if we got this small application running in one container, but we need a second container? Like extracting metrics from that main container. Then if we want two of those main containers, then we need another two containers to call the metrics. If we want one 100 containers, then we need another one 100 containers. So it just gets messy. You don't know which containers related to which one. What if we need thousands, hundreds of containers across multiple zones, across multiple regions, across multiple servers? And I don't want to get into each server and say, hey, I want 10 containers here. Hey, I want another 10 containers here. Hey, I want, no. I just want to say, I want 100 containers in total. And I want it balanced. What if we want to scale based on thresholds and metrics? This is something we use a lot. And this is a base idea of, of this, right? To say, hey, I need to scale based on traffic, based on the requests that are coming in, based on resources. Like, I'm mostly in special days, like Mother's Day, like Cyber Monday where our app is more used, right? What if we want to update these new small talk images, these new versions with different strategies? Let's say I want to take one old container and boot up a new container with a new image. What if I want to say, hey, I don't want my whole traffic to, to, to go to these new containers. I want to boot up all the containers and say, well, first go with the 20% of the traffic once I'm tested, I'm sure that it's working fine in production, then move all the traffic to those containers. Or maybe I just wait completely for those new containers to work up and then redirect the whole traffic to it. What if we want to restart those containers based on health check? This is something we use a lot in our dev environments, QA environments, and sometimes in production. There are bugs, right? It's common that our developer teams or test testing teams, they they find these bugs and they cra the VM crashes sometimes, right? And we need to wait a way to detect that automatically and restart those containers. We don't want to have a DevOps waiting for a container to crash to restart it. No, we need to detect it automatically so our QA testing teams keep testing 
keep developing, right? What if we want to restart the whole platform? Because just I want, I don't want to hear a downside. We needed some kind of robust system where I put up one container, take one down and do something like this for all 100 containers I got without generating out. What if I want to reduce cost? Let's say for example, or debug your environments are normally, they are not normally used at midnight. Normal people just start working at 6 o'clock p.m., right? So why to keep them on? We could turn it off and put it up on morning. But for all this, when it's something else, because what we got now doesn't allow us all of this. When it's something new, a new technology, we need something that allows us the orchestration of those containers. And for that, we use Kubernetes. Kubernetes by a lot of functionalities, resources, is able to solve all these problems and many more. But I want you to give up in mind one abstraction. That's this one. Before we got a node, we containers thrown all over there. But Kubernetes is a way. What if we got a node, a pod, a container inside a pod? Now we don't scale based on containers, we scale based on pod. Now we can have our bus application and that side container and it's scaled based on those pods and not in containers. But where is it? Where is Kubernetes? It's in the cloud. There's nothing that stops you to have it on-premise. But again, the idea of the cloud is to have hardware like this and remove hardware like this, right? To be able to scale fast, to pay only for what you use. And there are many cloud providers out there. So which one do we choose? We got, for example, Highway Cloud, AWS, Azure. But what, you're going to tell all clients, hey, you can only use AWS? No, we don't have to complete a dashboard cloud provider. We need to integrate. We can't limit all code based on these cloud providers. We need to be multi-cloud. But as most of our clients use AWS, I think it deserves a special mention, or at least of some of the few resources we use because got a great solutions out there. For example, we got AGS, which is oh, sorry. We got AGS, which is databases from instances to, cl to, to clusters. We master a slave schema. We got EC2. We got a lot of resources. Um, but the main one is these servers where we run Kubernetes. Then we have Elastic Ache, which is offers Mengache, Redis. Then we have Law Balancer. Probably many of you already know what's a Law Balancer. Then we have Secret Manager that is a full tool. Um, store these, these secrets like credentials, certificates, uh, and with different kind of, of, of functionality like rotation, encryption. Then we have ECR2, which is a registry where we pu push those those images and then we pull it to restart the container. Then we have EFS, which is basically an identified system, which is a file system that can extend to infinity and beyond, more or less. And the great thing about this is that you can have the same file system for all your pods. So now you can keep consistency over files. Now any pod can access to that same file, to that same report, to that same log, to that same directory. Then we have WAF, which is a web firewall. Great. Now we got Kubernetes. We got the we got the cloud. We got containers. So I told you about a little bit of availability. I told you about scalability. I told you about reducing risk. I also tell you before we got a problem of deployment, now you can tell me, hey, deployment just got a little messy here. We got a lot of things now. Yeah. So we need a way to ensure continuous integration and continuous deployment. So we had a lot of options, but one simple schema that we follow is this kind of pipeline where we got this GitLab CIC up pipeline where we build that image and all developers can choose to deploy that image to any environment. It doesn't take hours, it can take just a few minutes. How we, why we does that job from behind? It updates a hand repository. We generate that image and we go to that Helm repository. What's the Helm repository? Helm repository, imagine it as templates with values for different environments. Once you combine those templates with a specific value for that specific uh, environment, you render Kubernetes manifest. It's useful to declare new resources or update resources inside Kubernetes. 
Okay, so we update a specific tag saying this is a new image. But we don't need a DevOps to go to that repo, to download that, uplo upload it to, to Kubernetes. No, we need something more automatized, right? For that, we got Argo City. Argo City offers a lot of great functionalities, but the main one is that it can watch over Helm repository, right? When it detects a new commit, it can decide, hey, this new commit is generating a new resource. Hey, this new commit is updating a new resource inside Kubernetes. And we, by different configuration, we can say, hey, when that happens, automatically deploy it to Kubernetes. Or say, hey, wait for my approval, because maybe in production, I don't want it. The developer completely say, hey, now I'm going to decide to deploy this new version of production. Now, hey, maybe we want to double check. Cool. Now I'll tell you about deployment, reducing risk, the scalability, availability. But also tell you before about program observability, right? And now you can tell me, hey, okay, now we got three logs to look at because now we got a lot of containers. So if one container crash, we only have to, to look at the, the logs of that container. But how we do that, right? We need logs. And we use two kinds of logs. We use call logs and live logs, as we call them. Call logs are the ones that are in files, can be written longer, and are perfect for audits. And you can store them in any, in any place. You got, for example, the FES, as I told you before. Then we have live logs that are better for, for better observability. They are perfect for data analysis, and they can be written shorter because Usually they tend to be expensive, right? But you don't need six months of data, just maybe the last month, because I need to debug what happened in production, what happened in that environment. So what are live logs? We're standard up. Now you can say, hey, first of all, I don't get what's happening here. There is a blurry, sorry for that. There is configuration information, but again, it's just messy. It's a standard up, man. Is that that's not better observability. So we need something else, something to to understand this, right? So for that, we need a few more components. We got a file bit that grabs those 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 standard output and send it to Lostash. In Lostash, we parse them. We even the format we want. We maybe change message. We are able to add things. We are able to to tag them. We're able to say, hey, add this filter. A lot of functionalities, and then we throw them to Open Search. In Open Search, we not only have a better human readable readable thing, but also we are able to search those logs by different tax filters, by by regex, by a lot of things. But it doesn't have to stop there. Once it's an open search, you're able to generate business metrics. That's the one you can see right now. Okay. Once it's an open search, you are able to integrate with Afana and generate better visualizations. Like the total requests we are getting per minute. The time it takes to respond them. Then we got even the total amount of users per minute and per pod. Cool. But now I want to, under, to know what's happening with my bus machine inside. I need metrics. And for that, we need a new, new change in our infrastructure. And I spoiled it before. What if we got a side container collecting metrics? So our application is able to expose these metrics. This metric collector graphs them. And by Prometheus, a monitoring tool, graph those metrics and expose it to Grafana and HPA Kubernetes. Grafana, as you saw before, is to generate visualizations, but HPA Kubernetes, what is it? It's, take a, it's an API of Kubernetes that you make a lot of configurations based on those metrics and say, hey, I want to scale based on this. Once it goes beyond this threshold, scale this amount of pods or continue scale. This is a maximum. We have a lot of functionalities over there. Cool. So once we have this infrastructure, we can now view, for example, the new space, the old space, the sockets per pod, the pool size of those pods. We got a lot of metrics. Okay. And based with all we learn, all I, all I tell you, let's put it in practice. We have this problem in production that really happened where our pods had low CPU, low memory. Everything was right, right? No. In special days, like Mother Days, Cyber Monday. Just we take longer to to respond to requests. So what's going on? By debugging, we figure out by all these metrics that we use, right? The logs. So we we find out we got those specific days. Or clients 
use a specific API that make a lot of selects to the database and wasn't brought out the database. The database was fine. The select wasn't wrong because there were simple selects. So what's the problem? But if I, we figure out, hey, also by these metrics, the pool size of each pod is at a maximum. So it wasn't a problem of scaling vertically, adding more resources to something. It was a problem of scaling horizontally, adding more pods. As you can see right now in this, this tiny video, once the pool size goes beyond the threshold, in this case, for example, 50%, we decide to scale one pod to attend that traffic. And if you pay attention, once it goes down, we don't decide to take that pod down because we wait for a stabilization window to say, hey, after this amount of seconds, after this, amount, about, uh, after this few minutes, take that pod down because I'm sure the traffic is low, right? As you can see right there. Cool. So we're able to solve all more problems, right? Now, problems never end, even for DevOps. So what if this won't change? Give me a second. What if we got, for example, an API that after a specific version stopped working and make it worse, it just crash the VM, right? Crash the container. We have a problem there, and we want to isolate that problem because, well, it doesn't want to work, but so. So we got a problem there, and the, the infrastructure we got, now any request can fall into any pod. So if just everybody decides to use that API, all the containers will start restarting. Instead of ensuring availability, we're ensuring downtime. So we need a way to isolate the problem. Then, okay, I got the health fix for this, 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 this server, right? I don't want to apply it to the 100 containers I got, the 100 pods I got. I just wanted to apply it to the pods that attend that kind of traffic. But now, all my pods attend that kind of traffic. What if I want to scale based on what is used? What we saw before, we scale all the pods. In this case, we're just one and we scale to two pods because we watched the demo. But we have 100 bots, we scale based on those 100 bots. And we don't only scale horizontally, we can scale vertically. Let's say we got another service that consumes a lot of memory, a lot of CPU, but it just used once a day. So we don't need 20 bots. We don't need 100 bots for that. We maybe just need one. And we don't want to scale the memory and CPU of those bots. We want to scale only that one. For right now, we can't. What if we want better observability? Great. Now, if a container crash, we have lower logs to look at, lower memories to look at. So, but still we have 200 services, 200 different APIs. So any one of them could crush the VM. So we need a better way to reuse that, that amount, right? To say, hey, I only, in this pod, I only got three different APIs. And we were able to solve it by this infrastructure that you can see right now. We got a client that connects to an API gateway. It's sent it to an ingress. It, the resource inside Kubernetes, they say, hey, I'm going to send the request to a specific service inside that Kubernetes. Services in Kubernetes are like mini load balancers that balance the traffic between pods. And now, by this infrastructure, we're able to say, hey, group these pods. We are able to, to group pods based on the service, based on the APIs. And so if we want to scale, Banks is very used and it consumes a lot of memory, we can scale the resources of it. We can scale memory, we can scale CPU. And then we have cars. Cars doesn't consume a lot of memory, doesn't consume a lot of CPU, but it's used a lot. So we need more containers and scale based on traffic. So we can add more. What if this new version has an API that just stopped working and crashes in a specific API of as a service transaction? Or containers, for example, crash. And I want to apply these hotfix to everyone because just fix something specific for that service. So instead of applying it to the seven containers I got now, the seven pods I got now, I can say, hey, I just apply it to that the only only those two pods. And it's much faster than applying it to seven. So this is all possible by service segmentation. Thank you very much. That was it. If you got any questions, are we happy to, to answer them? 
Uh, I like how you spoke about the, a very practical case on high scale. That was very insightful. Uh, one thing that I was wondering is the different roles of the different APIs that you can scale independently and patch independently. This one? Yeah. I was wondering, you guys found it was it was more convenient for the developers to have a monolith configured differently or different uh, images completely different for each uh, of those? Yeah. They all share the same code. They still having the same code. So, but... Like again, again, you if you 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 will consider all of them as a whole. You can't do what I just saw, right? You you can't scale based on CPU. You can't scale just a specific group. It's the idea of reduce the responsibility over each component. I want to reduce the responsibility of each one. Uh, do you get me? Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, no, I, I was wondering more like for the convenience of if you sometimes one in one of them or developing a feature or a fix for one of them. Uh, triggers that you need to refactor that it's also that it is going to affect at least the release of all the other ones too eventually. Yeah. If you have a big hot fix like you have to apply to the whole platform, you still have to apply to everything. But in this case we got for example this service transaction that all is a, a, a error in a specific method just used by this specific ABI. So let's say this this is an hour of high concurrency of users and we want to fix it now. But we don't want to restart the whole platform. Okay, we we by restarting we don't generate downtime, but it still is restarting. So we don't want that. We don't want to wait an hour to finish. Like in this case, we have seven. But imagine if you have one hundred, it takes a lot to restart each single one of them. So maybe by just applying it to those two, and then you can apply that hotfix if it's necessary later. Later in an hour, we we have lower traffic. Right. No, no. I, and of course, uh, you, you might get the uh, maintenance window for contract for one and you work on that one. It will upgrade on the other ones at its time in its own later maintenance window. Yeah. Fine. But the, the, the eventually the same code base will level up in everything. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I, I wanted to know if you work, were working actually like that. Cool. Thank you. Hi, nice work. Uh, this is the world of Kubernetes. You have great observability rules. This is the world of, of DevOps. You have a great ingress and API gateway observability rules you can trigger on CPU and several uses. This is the world of DevOps. But now uh, we have the, the small stop world. So whenever you have a bottleneck or one of the pod is stacked and consuming CPU, we would like to have an alert on high usage of a profiling method. So you can blame which small talk method because you may think maybe it's the database, maybe the problem is there, but do you have alerts or, or observability on a specific inside the pod of which method was running and which method is stuck? Can you get there from? Okay, uh, yeah, I get your question. Um, the metrics we got now is more related to APIs than the specific methods inside, uh, but that's in development. It's more about the developers behind that. The small talk. We are just the DevOps, and we take care of all of this. How to take it to the cloud and how to scale based on that. Future work. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, hi. You briefly mentioned about having like uh, health checks for every component. I was wondering if you're using like a simple health check coming from Kubernetes or you have developed some kind of specific health check for every part of your application. Yeah, uh, we got a specific API that checks the this, this whole service status. So Kubernetes allows you not only to do TCP checks, also allows you to do HTTP checks. So we check, we, we ask that, that a specific API for the health of the container and it doesn't have a specific time or, or, or doesn't answer well. We decide to, to resolve. We have a lot of, 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 well, after three times, after 10 seconds, we got a lot of configurations right there. Okay, but you're not like doing a functional health check. Yeah, the, the developers do it behind the code, right? We go to that API and they do the whole check. All right, code behind. Yeah. All right, thanks. No more questions? You're welcome.